This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I do want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, Script to Screen series examines the screenplay from the perspective of writers, directors, actors, and producers. Um, and we're very honored to be here with you all today. We have, um, sorry, I just saw the end of this movie with you guys, so it's going to take a little moment. Uh, it's brought to you by the Department of Film and Media Studies, the Carsey Wolf Center. But more importantly, I think this, is, this series is brought to you by the students and the Apollo Theater interns. Yeah. In, in three days, we, 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 found, we were able to put this event together. They're the ones who marketed the event, got all of you here, put it all together, planned this TV show, which we are now streaming live to the Academy for Academy voters. So please thank them on the way out for the people in the theater. They're the ones who deserve all the credit. But today, we are here to celebrate 12 Years a Slave. Uh, it's been nominated for nine Oscars, and I think I remembered all of them. Best Picture, Director, Supporting Actor, Actress, Supporting Actor, Costume Design, Production Design, but more importantly, for the purpose of our TV show, Best Adapted Screenplay. So please welcome to the Apollo Theater stage, Mr. John Ridley, the screenwriter of 12 Years a Slave. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so, you obviously, we have a lot of emotional scenes and complex characters to talk about, but I thought we'd start at the beginning to give us a little time to come down from the movie. Um, so there's a lot of research out there, obviously, about slavery. What was it about Solomon Northrop's book that, you know, made the story work for you the best? Uh, first of all, thank you for, uh, for having me here, and thank you for putting it together. It was, uh, I was actually in Austin working, and, and for you all to put this together in, in such short time and for everybody to come out, it's, it's deeply appreciated. Um, Solomon's memoir is, you know, I've been very fortunate, I had a very good education, read many stories about many different subject matters, um, thought that I knew a good deal about slavery. And Solomon's memoir is honestly, it's one of the most singular documents, personal narratives that I've ever had the opportunity to read. Uh, his clarity of detail, his elevated uh, language that he uses, um, the way he describes scenes and situations, but more importantly, the way that he talks about his experience, but without bitterness and without hatred and finding beauty in humanity in circumstances that were absolutely inhuman. I think it's one thing to write about these things. It's one thing to hector people about uh, things that need to change. It's a, another thing to really be able to write and, and move people in, in a particular way because you can see things that other people cannot. And I think it's sometimes easy, easier for us in 2014 to look at the world and, and, and to try to understand and see where we've been from. If you can imagine being in a circumstance in uh, 1841, 1842, being a free person of color, not a freed man, but born free, have that taken away from you, being taken away from your family, and experience the things that you saw here, but not walk away with bitterness and hatred toward everyone of a particular background or a race and see things as being conditional. That's what moved me the most. Um, that was powerful. It was powerful the first time I sat down to read that memoir, and it was powerful when I saw this ending again for I, I, I don't know how many times I've seen it. For me, uh, I was quite surprised uh, about one of your scenes and in, in, in the memoir that uh, there would be a, a slave with an open relationship with their slave owner. Yeah. Were there any other surprises or we could talk about that or was it something that really surprised you about slavery in your research that you didn't know? Yeah, I, to begin with, you're talking about the, the scene with Alfre Woodard mm -hmm. playing Mistress Shaw where she has an open relationship with a plantation owner. Many people would think of those relationships as the Patsy Master Epps where it's completely illicit and immoral. Uh, that 
that being the, the Mistress Shaw scene where Alfred Woodard has found a way to elevate her circumstances somewhat was surprising to me. There were any number of things that were surprising to me about that era. Again, coming into it, being a person of color in 2014, growing up with stories. You know, I had a conversation with my dad on Sunday, and he's 77 years old. He's John Ridley III, I'm John Ridley the Fourth, And we realized we're not that far removed from this. You know, we're not, 160 years ago, it was a long time ago. It, it wasn't that long ago. So for someone like me, there's a sense of some stories that were handed on or, or, or pictures or, or things that go back a little bit. And you think, yeah, okay, well, I, I know about slavery. I know about it in a particular way because of where my family came from. Other people can get educated. I, I, I know some things. And the things that I learned about the system in America, there were some folks who will say, well, slavery, yes, it was bad, but there was slavery throughout history. So why should we be surprised that America had slavery? The system here was unique, as all of these systems are. Now, slavery did not come to America fully formed. It started with indentured servitude and became slavery and became slavery based on the concept of racial inferiority. And then that was sold to people over 160 years. The only way any of these systems work is a mass psychosis that goes on. And unless we see that, it becomes so easy to separate, you're the victimizer and I'm the victim. And the reality is we're all victims of this. And even though we've come so far in this country, sometimes we look at ourselves and go, why do we have trouble getting past race? Why do we have trouble getting past it? Because this was sold to all of us for so long. And you get through slavery, and then you get to a failed reconstruction and segregation and Jim Crow all the way up through Loving v. Virginia in 1967 and the 70s and busing and things like that. We're not that far removed. So for me, it was a huge education. And it started with that supposition that I knew anything when the reality is I'm as, as ignorance goes, I put myself at the top of that list. The irony for me is the United States, which is a newly formed government, prided itself on equal rights and the Bill of Rights. So of all the countries, you would think this would be the one where it did not happen. Well, it's interesting because you know, we, we talk about the Founding Fathers and the ideals and the Constitution and things like that, but you really go back and read. People like Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were so concerned about putting so many of these ideals down in writing because they really... The interesting thing, one of the... One of the things that made the Founding Fathers the smartest was understanding that if you put some things in writing, people take that as a solid contract and that's it. And they were really concerned that if you put this down, that in time people would not want to move beyond some of these things. So when you start putting things in writing that you know, people of color are not full human beings, or not really dealing with the subject of slavery within that document, it made it actually harder for us to maybe move away from some of those things. But it is interesting because a lot of times we talk about, you know, well, the Constitution, you know, cannot change in some ways. The reality is, of course, it has changed in many ways over time. And, and thank goodness for that. You know, we've changed. The country has changed. Our views, our perspectives, they have to change. But also in that fundamental sense of, well, these guys put it down on paper and they knew what was best. Many of them put it down on paper with a fear that we or some of us would look back years later and go, well, well, this is it and that was all there is to it. You know, we're... We are a progressive people. I mean, that's a reality. You know, people talk about whether we're right, left, or center right, or center left. I mean, ultimately, we're progressive. And we've got to look at all of these things from a progressive nature. I mean, that's just a reality. Now, do you think, uh, I mean, at the time and also the movie, was it easier for people to be interested in Solomon's story because he started as a free man like everybody else in the North? And was it easier for them to relate to his story when he came out? Because they could take that point of view, the concept we could be enslaved too. One of the things, and people ask about whether this story may be easier to digest because some of us can put ourselves into that circumstance. Uh, one of the things to remember is that for people of color who were slaves at that time, in slave states, as you saw in this film, to be able to read or write was a death sentence. So you're talking about a system where hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, were either enslaved, part of the slave system, quite frankly, didn't make it to the United States of America because of uh, the slave trade. Uh, so within that, you have maybe 100 written narratives from a first-person perspective that involved slavery. So one of the reasons Solomon could even write his story because he was a free man and had the ability to read and write. I don't know that any of us came into him saying, well, this story is, let's do this one because this one is going to make it easier for individuals. 
to be able to relate to that story. For me, what was powerful in it was not so much the relatability of Solomon in and of himself, but it was the things that Solomon took for granted. I don't think, I'm pretty sure there's nobody in this room who take a, a, a whip to anyone. But think how many times you, know, you, you walk out the door and you're dismissive to someone who's important to you. You don't think about seeing them again. You don't think about your children. Um, it's a little hard for me because I've been away and I've been working and I really think about my kids. But those are the things that were really powerful to me. There's nobody in this room who's going to willfully um, take someone rights away, beat someone, treat someone like a dog. Maybe you're short in line at Taco Bell with people. You know, maybe, <laughs> you know, do you know what I mean? We have those moments. But the thing that was really powerful to me was this person who had an education, had a life, had stature, had circumstances, and just could not see how precious they were. Mm -hmm. And could not, you know, understand how easily those things can slip away from all of us. And I, I, I don't even mean the bigger picture of our freedom and our liberty, but things that we hold very precious to us. That's what was powerful to me when, uh, when I first read the story. And again, watching that scene again, when he's reunited with his family, and Solomon says, you know, forgive me. Uh, you know, it, it wasn't for me in the writing a forgiveness of, uh, you know, I was tricked into slavery. I, I left 12 years ago, I didn't leave a note. I didn't feel it was necessary to say goodbye in a proper way. That was really powerful to me. And so for me, what was attractive about that story was, you know, I, I always felt the story was just big in and of itself. You know, if, if the people involved with this film were gonna tell a story that was about an American circumstance that we haven't really examined, that was really big. But again, for a film to be relevant, it's got to be informative. And, I, and again, I don't think there's anyone in this room who needs to be informed about you know, the decency of human nature, but I think the preciousness of life. And again, when I read Solomon's memoir, his ability to just see those little moments, and that came with a perspective that I really believe was formed in that 12 years. For me, I actually was kept wondering when I was seeing it, um, what about his family? What are they thinking? I mean, there was, obviously there was no oh. note. Like 12 years, they don't yeah. know where dad went. They don't yeah. know where their husband went. Uh, it was just... They didn't know exactly where he went, but unfortunately, um, the kidnapping of freed people was just far too prevalent. So mm -hmm. they began to be able to piece together the circumstances mm -hmm. of what happened. But, you know, this is, I, 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 I want to say this, you know, very carefully, you know, different from having a capacity to instantly communicate with people and, and say with an amber alert or putting, you know, mm -hmm. pictures on a milk cart. You know, this was a time when someone, vanished. You know, you, you did not know what happened to them. You did not know where they ended up. And you did not have the capacity to reach out immediately and say to people, you know, be careful, be wary, be alert. So if you can imagine those moments where, you know, you go to the hospital and he's not in the hospital, or you, you wait for news and it doesn't come, and you start to hear stories where we met these two men, and he was going down to Washington, and you start to realize the, the closer you get to what traditionally was the Mason-Dixon line, you start to understand what happened, and you don't have the capacity to call the police station in Louisiana or down past Washington, and at least, you know, you make someone known. The fugitive slave laws were put into place to aid the people who were kidnapping, you know, not, not to aid uh, people of color. So the family knew. The, the sad part was there was very little that they could do. Well, I, I was interested because uh, Solomon, I mean, you have a great ensemble piece here. Yeah. I mean, you have a lot of wonderful characters. How did you balance trying to give space for your ensemble characters but also develop Solomon's character? Well, again, and, you know, I, I hate to default to the answer. There's so much <laughs> of this that goes to Solomon in his memoir. And I will say this. Uh, I, I hope and appreciate you enjoyed the film, but I really hope that you'll take the time to read the memoir. It's out. It's in public domain. You know, you can find it. But the way that he makes the story not about himself and makes it about the people that he finds and that he meets and those experiences 
it's really pretty beautiful. And in that writing and in that detail, uh, these were characters that I wanted and hoped that we could explore and give balance to. I think the one sad thing is that there were so many individuals in these 12 years. You know, there are many people that, um, in the writing, as with anything, when, when you're being reductive and, and making it about a, a two-hour film, you, you can't put everyone in. You can't put every circumstance in. And different from a story that maybe I made up and it was like, okay, you know, that's a character maybe I liked in my mind that's not going to go in. There was something about knowing that these were real people and this may be one of the opportunities to share their lives and we weren't going to be able to do that. And, you know, that, that was, it was a reality in writing, but it was kind of difficult sometimes. There were some beautiful and amazing people that Solomon met. And I do hope from this film people will choose to read the memoir because it's, it's a beautiful memoir. Uh, the first scene that hit me the hardest, actually, was uh, uh, the woman having her children stolen. Yeah. from her and then there's a moment her later lives, the so. white slave woman saying oh well you'll, they'll soon be forgotten that's okay I have something in it and they'll soon be forgotten <laughs> I, I mean is that something so I mean that to me summarized you know the horror of slavery for me just having a woman just be just so dismissive is that something that was in the memoir or you just kind of it was in the them? memoir and it's one of those things because people people who have not seen the film or people who are cautious about coming to it say oh this is going to be a difficult film to watch and I can't you know you've seen it I can't kid you that it's not difficult. <laughs> uh, but when you, when you break it down, there are maybe three very physically difficult scenes. The hanging scene, the soap scene, the scene where, where Solomon is first in the slave pen. Those are very, very tough. But I think other scenes that become extremely tough are these moments, you know, again, we know the, about, you know, the physicality of it all, what we would do or wouldn't do or, or moments like that. But I think when we start to think about those moments, what if we were torn away from our children and our mm. family and we had no recourse? You know, to me, those are the things that are extremely difficult because we prepare ourselves coming into these kinds of stories mm. with, okay, there, there are going to be moments and they're going to be difficult and we can, you know, we're, we're, we're human and we're, we, we can handle it, but we don't often think about the fact that, you know, people talk about traditional family values and throw that phrase around. You know, traditionally, people of color, there was no value put in their family. There was nothing. There was no law to protect it. There was no way that you could uh, have legal ownership of your children or your wife. You know, there, w there was nothing there. And I think those things are very, very tough to people because that's not what you came in prepared for. You know, you came prepared for something else sometimes, but it's those things that really hit you. And it, it, it was to be like the Benedict Cumberbatch character fascinated me because he considers himself a good Christian, yeah. a good slave owner, uh, which I, yeah. I find baffling. But, and uh, of course a coward because he wouldn't actually, he had a chance to save Solomon yeah. and didn't turn it down. Was it an interesting character to kind of explore, kind of the hypocrisy, even more of him because of... It was, and I think it was very important. I mean, first... All of these actors, you know, drop, you know, I can't say enough about, first of all, their talent and their ability, but if you can imagine being just yourself and saying, look, I'm going to drop into this character. And I think sometimes for any of us, whether we're, we're individuals, whether we're actors, as, as much as you want to be in that role, I would have thought coming into it, there would be that element of, you know, you want, you want to step back a little bit and let people in the audience know, look, I'm just, I'm playing a part. This isn't me. You know, it's, mm. you know, there, there's that element of reality. The fact that all of these people, Benedict, you know, uh, Paul Giamatti, Sarah Paulson, mm -hmm. gave themselves over so completely to these parts mm. is absolutely phenomenal. I was not down there for a good deal of the filming, but for these moments where, you know, the director, Steve, would, would say action, and, and these individuals would have to do things or say things that was not them and not their nature. And then cut, and you have that moment, you know, you don't, you don't get a long amount of time to then go and do that scene again. I can't say enough about their abilities. That's self-evident, but I can't, that's self-evident. Mm -hmm. I also can't say enough about what they allowed themselves to go through for all of us to see this film and experience it. But in particular, with his character, Master Ford, I think I thought it was important to have that character for the obvious reasons of the hypocrisy that he's talking about. But I thought it was also very good because it was indicative of something else. You know, people around the country were also in that space, not just Southern whites. You know, people around America at that time benefited from uh, the slave system and that slave economy. 
And it wasn't just guys like Master Ford who were tepid in their approach to abolition. You know, there were, there were people in the North, too, who, you know, slavery is bad, but cotton is good. You know, slavery is bad, tobacco is good. And I think one of the things, you know, while we're in this space, I would say that's very important to me. Again, I think it's all, it's, it's kind of easy for a lot of us to say, you know, you come out of this film, and I think one of the dangers of this film is you come out of it and go, you know, thank God we're not those folks anymore. You know, thank God that that was 160 years ago and we're not like that. There is more slavery going on in the world per capita right now than any other time in our history. And I put myself, again, at the top of that list. There are those of us who benefit from a system. Uh, sometimes it's extreme and we have nothing to do with it, like trafficking, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. Other times it's forced labor. Um, I'm not here to preach. I'm not here to indict. Again, I put myself at the top of that list. What we saw was not just 160 years ago. What we saw is not in the past. And as much as I want people to come out of this movie feeling good about ourselves and our country and how we progressed, uh, what we have to remember is there are people in that circumstance right now, and they're not all in foreign countries. They're not all removed. Some of them are right here. Okay, And that, for all of us in, in, in involved with this film, it has become a passion for all of us. It's become a passion for Steve, the director, for Dee Dee and Jeremy. And if we can speak to it and, again, just remind people of it, because it is important to keep that in mind. But that character was very important, I think, in terms of the film, but also very important for reminding people that it's sometimes it's easy to compartmentalize about these things. And say, well, it's those folks. And sometimes we got to be mindful of who we are and what we're doing. And then, of course, Paul Dano's character, Tibbetts, was the the, yeah. the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, cruelty and jealousy and so many things interesting. How did you go about developing his character? He was again a character that was very outsized in in the book itself. Uh, Paul and I had a chance to meet him, and he's a wonderful guy and a tremendous actor. And again, a lot of courage in playing somebody, you know, on the one hand, you have an educated individual in Benedict Cumberbatch's character who can compartmentalize. You have another character who operates out of a sense of fear when he's, his own ignorance has shown up. When Solomon is talking about terraforming and things like that, and he goes through his resume, he goes, what do you know about, you know, terraforming? They go, well, I'll tell you what I know. <laughs> you know, and, and you go through that resume, and to have a character just, you know, it, it was important to me to show all aspects of why the system worked. You know, some folks were ignorant. Some folks were hateful. Some folks, like that Sarah Paulson character, was dropped into her own bit of ugliness because of what her husband was doing. It was not all one thing. It was not, these folks were evil and that was it. You know, that was the easiest thing in the world, I think, for anyone to do. And I don't mean for myself, but for, as a writer for Solomon, to just go, well, these folks were all mean, they were all evil, they were all ugly, and that's what all there was as opposed to saying they were circumstances and they were conditions and all mm -hmm. of them needed to be addressed. And, uh, well, then, the way was, uh, Patsy and Michael Fassbender. Yeah. Uh, we'll start with him, for example. Now, he, to me, was probably the most difficult character for me. As a writer, how would you be, be able to get into his head? Because he's... That was hard. Um, <laughs> it was hard on a lot of levels because, again, there was that... Part of it was just, okay, well, this is the evil guy, and he's just going to be evil, and that's all he is, is evil. And I can write these evil things and step away from it, because that's all I have to do. But there was a complexity to that relationship between uh, Master Epps and Patsy. It was not good. There was nothing, there was nothing special about that relationship, but it was complicated. And... I wanted to make sure in expressing what Solomon was seeing that there was that kind of complexity beyond just, okay, she's physically, she's pretty, and I want that. You know, there was a guy who was not satisfied with his life. There was a guy whose wife was of a station that was even maybe slightly higher than his. And there was this feeling of want and desire and love that would never be returned in any way, shape, or form. And an incohate way of saying, expressing how he felt. Um, it was, for, for, you know, he was not a traditional villain in the sense that, you know, this was, this was Darth Vader or the shark or anything like that. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, it was very important in 
in a memoir that was very complicated to express that complex nature and not be afraid to go there. And not in any way, shape, or form with, with master eps or mistress eps to then forgive them because they were complicated or that there were things going on, but at the same time not being afraid to say, well, they are people and there is something happening there. And if we are going to go through this exercise, we've got to examine that and look at it uh, because I think there is benefit there. Um, it's the easiest thing in the world with anybody, whether you like them or hate them, to just say, well, you, that's all you are. You are that. That's it. As opposed to looking at people and saying, well, you're, you're, you're a complicated individual. I don't forgive what you did, but I can see that complexity going on there. And Sarah Paulson is interesting to me because she was actually looking out for Solomon for a while. Gave him the warning at the beginning, don't let my husband know that you can read. Yeah. And of course, turns on him later when he protects Patsy. Uh, for her, was, was kind of how did you grab, grab onto her character? I want to say, say this about that character. I want to say this about Sarah Paulson. If, if, if there was one character that I was really thought that I had failed, it was the Mistress Epps character. Because with Master Epps and that relationship with Patsy and his understanding that there's probably something more going on with Solomon, you know, it's working on several points. You know, it was working on several points. And I really thought with Mistress Epps, she was just going to be the shrill, true individual. And no matter how many times I went through and wrote it, I just felt like I'm not, I didn't service this. I didn't, I, you know, I, Maybe I, I, maybe I just, I, there are moments, I, 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 just, if you, if you have any objectivity about yourself, you go, okay, did I, did I do it, did I, whatever. Sarah Paulson came in and made choices that were just so deep and so spot on, and she did not have to overarch and mustache twirl and be angry. She was in charge, you know, every step of the way, and the way she could get into Michael Fassbender's head and just say these things and know how to, to work it, and her choices were phenomenal. And there are moments, you know, if you look me in the eye and ask me about the screenplay, I, say, ah, I, I believe I worked hard, I believe I researched, I believe I did all these wonderful things, but with Sarah Paulson, with Chiwetel, with um, Alfre Woodard, uh, the way they made those words dance, I, I cannot say enough about what they brought to it. Um, in my head I had a rhythm, in my head I had voices in my head I had things that I want to express but with that character in particular I really thought I, this is just she's she's going to come off as one note I did everything that I could I didn't get there and I remember the first time that I, I saw and there are other things you know true tell great I, you know the moment he hits it you go that's going to be great that's going to be great in the back of my head I'm waiting for Mr. Steps is going to come. This is not going to be good. This is not going to be good. <laughs> and honestly, the, the, not that I didn't think the other actors could, could get there. I, I felt like I gave them the tools. And Sarah, I cannot say enough about my fears and how I believe she found a way and did it. I will say independently of the words on the page. Uh, um, so one of the things that really struck me too was Patsy seeing where she goes to Solomon. You and I talked a little about the green room. Yeah. Uh, saying, you know, kill me. Yeah. Basically, uh, can you expand a little about th that one? Because that was kind of that was in the memoir. That was just a line in passing that Patsy said that uh, Solomon was talking about Patsy and she would fall into despair. And one day she came to me and asked me to kill her. And then he moves on from that. And for me, that was just a big pause in this because the idea that in 1841, the casualness mm -hmm. that people would, I mean, look, we're, we're in 2014 and unfortunately and tragically people, you know, they fall into a despair that they can't come out of. Um, but to be in a place where both the individual who is saying, I can't go on, and the person who is receiving it mm -hmm. is just, that's how life was, that really made me pause. That really made me pause and remind me that in that space and time, it was not unusual for people to take their lives, not because of uh, in a, an abundance of despair about, you know, an, an emotional despair that, that people fall into, a depression, but simply, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm picking cotton today, I'm picking cotton tomorrow, I'm picking cotton for the next five years. You know, I've seen people die in the field, I'll, I'll go hang myself. Um, it was not unusual for people to have children and take them down to the river because they did not want their children to live the life that they lived and could not see, you know, and well, you know, in, in five years, Congress is going to move on this, you know, in, in a couple of years, you know, my representative is going to work on this. If my representative doesn't do it, I'm going to vote him out of office. 
<laughs> for that moment, for me, that was a scene I really wanted to excavate and explore. You know, there, there's, there are few, if any, scenes that were wholly created. There are several scenes where something happened where I said, I, I need to try to explore this because this is so out of my wheelhouse. And Solomon and the characters around them take this as life. And that was one of the scenes where I was just, I, I, it made me pause and think about an individual who could not see a way out, did not have the strength to take that way herself and went to somebody else and said, I need you to do this. I will bribe you to do this. I will steal from the mistress to do this. And the thing is, it's interesting because Solomon always, he has hope. He knows like, I can't, there's a chance for me to escape. Yeah. And you kind of see in his eyes that he just doesn't understand. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't understand that she has no, this is no hope for her. He, he talks about these things. You know, there was a scene with Eliza where she talks about, you know, have you given up on your children? And he talks about, well, I'm going to keep myself hardy and I'm going to do this mm -hmm. and I'm going to, you know, and that, that's in the first, you know, year or so. You know, and there's an interesting thing in the memoir where Solomon says about the Benedict Cumberbatch character, you know, if all slave owners were like this, slavery wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine, you know, in a circumstance where, okay, if, if, if I'm going to be in this situation, this much of it I could tolerate. And that's sort of his own acceptance of, you know, I'll, 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 I'll find a way out of this. You know, I'll, 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 I'll clever my way out of this. You know, I will smart my way out of this. I will trick my way out of this. And over two, three, four years, you realize there is no, there's no more tool to get out of this. Um, that to me was part of that education for Solomon that what I loved about his character is that he was able to use all of himself to survive, his wits, his guile, his physicality, but at some point he realized that that all, rolled, that all falls by the wayside. And to me, that roll Jordan roll scene where he sort of gives himself over to something bigger than himself, you know, that's really, really powerful. And in the story and in that space, when he gives himself over, you know, something else does arrive to him, finally. But one of the things that was really interesting to me is Solomon has, you know, for a lot of the writing, he has a cool remove. He is reporting on a system that most people are not aware of. But even he, in that moment, you got to, sometimes we got to give ourselves over to something bigger. You know, this, things are bigger than us, whether you, you believe in a particular God or spirituality or just the fact that we're, we're sharing a dot in space. Something is bigger than us. And one of the beautiful moments in his memoir is when he finally gives himself over to that, that you can't smart your way out of circumstances. You can't guile your way out of it. You sometimes have to give yourself over to it. And in giving ourselves to something bigger, sometimes bigger things come. And I know it sounds this and that, but how many times do we see that? And of course, he's been disappointed so many times. Yeah. Solomon and the Brad Pitt scene. Yeah. Where you're just like, oh, he's going to disappoint me again, too. <laughs> well, I that, was the whole time. I was like, you know what? He's going to do it again. He's going to be another person who fails him. Well, the and interesting great thing in that moment in. for me in, in, in the memoir, you, you have this moment where the Canadian arrives and you, you feel like, <laughs> you know, the Mounties are here and it's all good. And Canada's this other place. But there's a moment for this guy, Bass, when he hears this story and goes, I don't know if I want to get involved in this. <laughs> And I thought that was really nice because it's that moment where you go, okay, you know, you're in your seat and you say, okay, here we go. Here's that cool remove. And even that, you've got to work it a little bit and understanding, you know, he is a foreigner in this land. Mm. And Michael Fassbender and his character makes it very clear, you know, that's a good idea if you're a Yankee up north. You ain't up north. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, they're to, to be an abolitionist, to, to try to free slaves, you know, that, that came with its own set of circumstances. So... There is that sort of nice moment where you go, oh, okay, you know, Brad Pitt's here, they say. <laughs> and it's like, oh, we're not quite there yet. And you, actually, because I watched it a couple of times, you really set up well because he, you get the sense he's not going to do anything. Yeah. That he's just listening. He says, you know what? I have to. And that, kind of, yeah, and that was. It is, yeah, it is that final moment where, you know, some people talk about, again, the Benedict Cumberbatch character, you know, I'll, mm -hmm. I will, I'll give you. God, I will give you the Bible. And that was the other thing about, you know, the Bible, some people didn't want slaves to have Bible. Some people did. I mean, we see a bit of that in there, you know, not just for the scripture itself, but, you know, do you preach scripture? Do you let them read scripture? Do you let them read a little bit? Do you let them read a lot? So there was all these kind of compartmentalizations. And even for, you know, the character of Bass and 
Fassbender does make a point about that character. You love to hear yourself talk, don't you? <laughs> a lot of us, you know, we, we love to talk on a situation. You know, myself included, love to pontificate about this or that. And then you go home, what are you really doing about that? Mm. So I, I was very happy in the memoir where you get to that moment. You know, I was sort of surprised. And it's like, okay, this is all going to be very, very good. And in reality, you know, in, in the reality, that space and time between starting to write those letters with Bass and what that meant and how long that was going to take. You know, it was, it was actually a significant amount of time mm -hmm. to get that to happen uh, w w within the story, the true story. Well, I think we have to move on to the scene, the whipping scene. Yeah. Um, I found it interesting because every character, almost every single character's storyline weaves into there. You know, is that, yeah. how, how did that process work for you? Because you have all these characters with their own little story yeah. coming together in such a... In you, know, a way. you know, look, I, I will say it and I will say it again and I have no fear of saying You know, Solomon was the partner in this. And for me, I, I will, I'll phrase it like this. There were, there were things early on in the first time that I read it. The, arriving to that scene and arriving to a lot of these moments in the script and in the film, a lot of it, the first time I read it back in 2008, I believe it was, around that time frame, and I, I read it, and it's beautiful, and it moved me, and we talked about it, and you know, there was no money to develop it, but we all agreed, you know, this is, this is worth doing. I'm going to go out and spec this script. And you sit down then to write it. You start going through it, and I'm, you know, a black man in 2008, and I'm, you know, you read it and go, okay, well, hell no, that's not going to happen. Solomon's going to kick his ass. You know, that's the first thing that's going to happen. <laughs> oh, hell no, that's not going to happen. Solomon's going to run away and punch somebody again, you know. <laughs> and then you start to go, well, that, you know, that's me. I'm starting to put me into it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I how, however much regard I might have for myself as a writer, you start to realize, well, I don't have anything other, better, or greater to say about this circumstance than what is said. And so there are a, a number of scenes where people end up saying really praiseful things about it and go, well, how did you get there? How did you get there? I don't mean to be flippant about it. I, I, I stayed true to the material. And in that moment, you do have all these things that are coalescing. You know, you have uh, the Fassbender's, Michael Fassbender's character of Epps, who is so finally outraged at, at Patsy or, or, or has his, you know, manhood so put into question that he has to do this thing. But he can't do this thing. So who's going to do this thing? You're going to do this thing. And you're going to do this thing to this person who begged you before to kill them. And in doing this thing, I can't quite do it. Well, if you don't do this thing, I'm going to take a gun and I'm going to kill all these other folks that are here. And this individual who is now going to be whipped is saying to you, I'd rather you do it. I'd rather you be the one. And in that moment where it can't quite, can't quite happen, Mistress Epps comes out and just says, you know, I don't remember exactly the line, but, you know, give her the whip, give it all to her, you know, and just says it in that calm fashion. But it was all of these moments coming together because emotionally... The thing about this memoir, it has an emotional velocity. It has it. And that was the moment, you know, the soap scene. I saw the, I saw the film for the first time. I was in London working on something, and the producers were kind enough to stream it for me. And you, they put it up in, you know, even though it's all digital, it's still broken up into reels. And so you put up a reel, and you watch it on the computer, and I'm in a hotel room alone. And it's a different experience. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you take a moment. Okay, that reel is done. Or let me roll back. How did they do that? And you know, honestly, the first time you see it, it's all you know, a lot of pictures like the word. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> you know you're not really watching. You're listening. Oh, who gets that line? And then you watch it again. But you have that space to do it alone, and, and take your time and do it the way you want to do it. Uh, I saw it the first time and with an audience at the Toronto Film Festival, um, and I knew what was coming. And I mostly was able to push through that scene. I've seen it three or four more times with an audience. I, 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 I can't watch that scene. I can't get through it. I know how it was done. I know it was coming. I know the tools of cinema that were used in it. I know one thing that happened right in the middle of it. Um, it's just a powerful scene. It's powerful in its physicality. It's powerful in the magistry that Sean Bobbitt, the DP, used to get that done. It is amazing that you have four or five actors who move through that space and hit every moment, not just their marks, but their emotional moments, the emotional beats. 
how Steve put it together. It is amazingly powerful. Um, and I've seen it once. Well, I, I mean, and, and uh, Lapita, I mean, she, not Lapita's only that phenomenal. scene, of course, the, that Lapita scene, of course. Lapita is an phenomenal. Amazing. She is a phenomenal human being. She is, you know, Lapita has done documentaries. She has traveled the world. She is so sweet, so lovely, so talented. Um, one of the joys, and we were talking about this backstage, one of the joys, after all of this, all the, the things you get through to, to, to be part of a movie, to, to get a movie made, to get it made, you know, first you, you hope it's decent, then you hope it's good, then you hope it has a, just an okay <laughs> opening weekend. You know, this film has been in theaters since October, and folks are still yeah. talking about it. You know, folks still want to come out on a, on a Sunday and, and see it, and I don't take that in any slight way. That is huge. And so for, for all of that process, if anything to come out of it, for all of these individuals, Sean Pobbett, the DP, Joe Walker, the mm -hmm. editor, uh, Adam Stockhausen, the, the production designer, all of these individuals, to get their due uh, for what they did and the chance they took is amazing. And certainly Lupita at, at the head of it. Um, I, I can't say enough about her as a person. I certainly can't say enough as, for what she did in her first major film role. Um, you know, we, we, there's an exercise that we get to do at the end of the year where, where we compare these films, and they're all singular, and they're all special. And I, I can't tell you how wonderful it's been getting to know so many people around it. But, you know, if we're going to go through this exercise, I'm absolutely going to sit and say wonderful things about these individuals who made this happen. And, you know, chief among them, you know, a, a, a young lady who was given a phenomenally difficult role and not only delivered on that, came out of the other end of it, and it's just been exceptional in, in speaking about it and speaking about these issues and speaking about what she went Is through. Is there anything like for her, you said, wow, I, I didn't, in the script, I didn't see it as way, but she did, wow, that was something I didn't even couldn't imagine. I will tell you, uh, yes, and I will tell you, and here's the thing about uh, making a film like this, because people will come out of it and say, oh, I, you know, I saw the movie and it's a really great screenplay. And I know what they really mean is, oh, I saw the movie, it's a really great movie. Because there are any, <laughs> I mean, that's a reality. There are any moments in it that, you know, honestly, they, they weren't there on the page. You know, they were not, I, I didn't put that in there. And then people will ascribe it to the, the screenplay. And I, I have to be very careful because that is, you know, it is hugely collaborative. And one of those moments is that moment where Lupita, the Patsy character, is making the corn husk dolls. <laughs> and in her process, in Lupita's process, she, and this is amazing, she said, okay, Patsy picks, well, there's 500 pounds of cotton a day. I think it was two, yeah, 500 pounds. You know, that, that was her range. And she said, okay, if she's going to do this, she has some kind of dexterity of her fingers. You know, you, you see the scene where uh, Solomon is trying to pick, and you see the scene where um, the other individual, I don't remember the, the Garrett Dillahunt's character, where he comes in as, and tries to be, and he, he just can't do it. So Patsy has this, Lupita is saying in her mind, Patsy has this dexterity that she can mm -hmm. do this thing. So she has dexterity, she's good with her fingers. What else does she do with her fingers? Does she have any artistic desire? So she, she thought about, okay, well, if I'm gonna do this, what else would I do? You know, if I'm not picking cotton, am I creating something? Am I creating something with my hands? What am I creating? I'm creating these corn husk dolls. What are they? They're family. Not in the script. Oh, interesting. Not in the script, okay? So I have to be very careful because people will come and say things about, I, but I have to be honest, you know, they will say things about it, that was her, or they'll say things, you know, Sarah Paulson was phenomenal. She was phenomenal, but that was a, an area where I felt I, I, I maybe fell flat. Um, it is collaborative, it is beautiful, it is wonderful, but in terms of what someone who came into it and showed me, that's what she did. But that speaks to her, her commitment as an actress to not just go, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to memorize my lines mm -hmm. and I'm going to cry at the appropriate parts. It's what's the totality of it. And that also, I think, speaks to Steve where he's like, beautiful. You have something to add to it? Let's find a space for it. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty phenomenal. Because uh, I've seen it three times. And definitely like, whether you watch it again to prepare for this. <laughs> uh, and I was trying to wonder what was the most impactful scene for me. And to me, it's the goodbye scene between Patsy and Solomon. That's the scene that affects me the most, and I was yeah. just wondering. I don't, 
I actually don't know how to phrase this question, so I'm going to hope you bail me out. Because <laughs> I don't know why. why, why it, was it, it just impactful? hit me. I, I no, think the thing just... that's really tough, and I think was, it was certainly tough for me, you get to the end, and again, one of the things that I think we were very fortunate to, to be able to do with this film, it's not conventional storytelling. It's not conventional in the way all these folks have put this story together. And it's not conventional in its narrative that you, you have these kind of built-in arcs that are supposed to hit and they're supposed to happen. And Solomon is a non-traditional hero in that he's, he's not... By his circumstance, he can't be overly proactive. He tries to be proactive early on, and he realizes what happens when you're proactive. So you get to this moment at the end, and you know somebody comes and he liberates Solomon, and Patsy's there, and emotionally, you know, you want that moment where he reaches back and, and she's coming with me, mm -hmm. you know, and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, <laughs> and that's not the reality. You know, that's not the reality. And I think there's that moment that is very powerful for people because you have that expectation that's, okay, here we go. You know, Solomon's, you know, he's, he's, he's going to, you want that, you know, and, and there's, there's a reason you want it and there's a reason you hope for it. And, and that's, you know, the, that great moment of, of those kinds of films where, you know, it, it's not just me. We're, we're, you know, I'm not leaving unless I can take everybody. You know, that it, it become a staple of theater because that's what we emotionally want. That wasn't Solomon's circumstance. And it was not for me to create that circumstance of, okay, you know, the Michael Fassbender saying, okay, well, you can take one off, but, you know, pick, pick one. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, that, that moment. And I think it is powerful because it reminds folks of a certain reality uh, and that we're dealing with reality. And I'm... I'm, I'm glad that people have that, you know, they don't go, well, okay, well, that, that movie was terrible because you didn't do this. But I'm also happy that in the end, we all chose to stick with the memoir and say, okay, it, it may not be the most satisfying ending, but it is the most honest ending. And especially Solomon's face when he finally realizes the truth that she cannot be saved. Yeah, and that's... Yeah, it's, um, you know, it, 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 it's... It is hard because it, what, what do you do? You have a person over your shoulder saying, we have to go now. Mm -hmm. We have to leave now. And you don't even get this long goodbye. I chose, there's no dialogue in there. There's no, you know, I will find, you know, and I don't say this to, to minimize those elements of cinema, but there isn't that moment where, you know, I will find a way, I will be back. You know, I will, we will fight until we, we change things. It was just that hug and then you're off. And, Chuatel doing that amazing moment where he looks back and just sort of turns a bit. Um, you know, again, that there's a level where it's not, it's not about the writing, it's not about the words, it's about all those things that are there, and all those things that are there are powerful because of, you know, the performances, the actors, the cinematography. It, it, it's cinema for, for a reason. Is that, is that actually, could you talk about your crew, even praising crew, isn't that kind of the, one of the best parts of this, how all you guys are sharing together now? The different yeah. crew, the actors, you, Steve. It's you know, amazingly appropriate because, you know, somebody asked me once, they, 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 they said, are you, um, did they, did they, are you happy because they shot the script that you wrote? And I, and I mean this sincerely. I think when I was 20 years old, I would have I answered that. Yeah, they shot the script that I wrote and I'm happy. <laughs> um, with, with time and working in space and particularly working in television where you really get to be collaborative every day, you realize, well, you don't, you don't want people to shoot the script exactly the way you, you wrote it. <laughs> and I think we've all seen the film where that, that's, you feel like that's just what you got. You got what was on the page and nothing more. And again, like the scene that uh, Lupita worked on and there was something else there and something unexpected or things that Joe Walker as the editor did where you know, I had it this way in the script but they put it together in a different way and deconstructed a little bit. Um, you know, when, when you've written it and you're still surprised by things, there's one moment towards the very end, there was a, something I wanted to see at the very end of the film that Sean Bob at the DP told me about and said, oh, there's a little moment here that happened. And I, I, I've seen it again three or four times and I'd never seen that moment. And this was the first time that I saw it today. And I'm not, I, I, I'm not going to say what it was, not because I want to trick you into seeing the film again, <laughs> but <laughs> because it was one of those things where if, if you've written it and you think you know what's coming and you think you've seen it and you've seen it three or four times, but somebody can say, oh, there, there's, there's a little thing here that happens and it's really kind of special and you really have to sort of 
watch for it. I think that's about the best thing you can say about cinema. And it's not merely this film. There are any number of films this year, I mean, that are immensely watchable and films that you can return to again. I think that's very, very special. It's great when you have a film that comes out and you enjoyed it and was really good and you had a nice experience. You went out with your family, your wife, your significant other, your partner, whatever, and you had a nice time. But those moments, you know, these films this year are immensely watchable. And I think that really sort of speaks to, you know, you know an appreciation of cinemas returning. You, know, you see more cinemas opening, you know, specialty cinemas, big mm. cinemas. You see people taking chances. Um, you know, we talked about this just a little bit outside. You know, I thought when the Academy went from, you know, five films to a potential of ten films, that's actually, it's not going to be a good move. We're just going to, you know, that was, I think, after uh, Dark Knight and there was mm -hmm. a concern that we don't have enough big movies in that. And then I think the year after that happened, one of the films that got in was, was Winterbone. Right. People were, were sort of like, well, what are we doing? And I think this has really been a good thing. <laughs> to sort of expand it and expand the conversation, you know, expand it in the sense that, great, you know, we're, we're, we're supporting all kinds of films. You know, people can talk about films. I mean, let's face it, at this time of year, it is become subjective, but that's part of the excitement of it. And, I, and I, in, in retrospect, you know, I think it's been a really, really good thing. Yeah, I, think I, I think you see it in a year like this. I don't think it's an accident that suddenly you get, you know, this is a year, you're gonna get 15 films easily. And, and good films and good in so many ways. Yeah, you mentioned we talked about the Winter's Bone launch tenant for the Orange, helped yeah. that. I'm hoping when we talked about Lapita gets launched from yeah, this. The people have now so. seen her around the world realizing she is a jewel and let's well, we give her about more this parts. Also that, you know, people, a lot of people, people who really know cinema maybe knew Michael Fassbender or kids who'd seen X-Men, you know, and it was mm. kind of divergent. <laughs> but this moment where people get to really see this gentleman's abilities as an actor, the same thing with Chiwetel, you know, where, where, where people, um, you know, they, they know him maybe from Salt, or they know him going back to dirty, pretty things, but they get to see that this individual can truly carry a film. And guys like Paul Giamatti, where you see him all the time, but a guy, you know, the friendliest, nicest guy, but comes in and just you know, has this part that kills. And again, you know, Alfred Woodard, Sarah Paulson, you know, you can go through this cast, actor by actor by actor, and either they were amazing coming in, and elevated and went somewhere else. And even, you know, I mean, Brad Pitt to come in and, and to take this part and to really, you know, a, a guy who is, I can't say enough about in taking a chance on this film. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I cannot say enough about, you know, Plan B and Brad Pitt's company made this film happen. You know, that is a reality. And this is a guy who could do anything in the world he wanted to do and had a team of people who said, we're going to do this. And one of the things, you know, people say, well, you know, he's going to do it and he'll drop in and, you know, play this part. You know, he, Steve had to go out and work him. He wasn't originally meant to be in this film. Oh. So this was not by any means, you know, this vanity project. Those folks at Plan B wanted to make this film happen, irrespective of what Mr. Pitt would do. And to have then the director have to go and say, look, man, we, you know, come on, be, be part of this. <laughs> And then for this actor who is off doing all of these things to go, okay, I can, I can make this work and I can do it. You know, again, I, I'm happy that people like Lapita are being elevated, but I think it really means a lot for individuals who have the capacity to do what they want to actually do what they want. Yeah, it's great. Great movies like this in Nebraska and a lot of other movies yeah. are getting so much attention uh, because of, you know, to take a chance. So has it been fun talking to all the other writers and all the other people that you, the movies you've enjoyed this year, getting yeah. to share in their kind of play? There was one event we went to and eight of the 10 writers or writing teams, you know, from adapted and original, we, we were all in the same space. And to sit with people that you don't know and don't know their process or people that you got to work with a little bit or tangentially or people who you've met maybe at one of these other events but never really sat with, out of all the things that I will really take away from this is how collegial it's been, how interesting it has been, how people have been so supportive of each other and willing to tell stories. You know, the, the story that I told about Lupita, you know, I can't tell you how many other writers you would go to and go, how did you do this? How did you do Oh, you know, somebody else came up with this, or, you know, we argued about that and we sort of settled on that. And that is sort of really interesting to me because a lot of times, you know, I, I know you folks have made a choice to come here today and sit and listen to me. I still enjoy listening to other writers. 
and hearing about their circumstances. Well, we, have, uh, we always end our show with the same question. And so we're wondering if you could tell us about a movie theater experience you had a child, as a child, or some very special t experience going with a movie with your family or some. You know, my parents, my dad is a doctor. My parents are still with me. Um, and my dad's a doctor, my mom's a teacher. Grew up in a small town in the Midwest. And they were, you know, really, you know, went to church every Sunday. Very, you know, kind of Methodist. We kind of, you know, just, we kind of this kind of, of folks, you know what I mean? And so my parents were very, and I don't think I appreciated it at the time, um, you know, they were very involved in my life about what I could watch on TV, things I would listen to. And I remember when I was, um, uh, yeah, it was probably about 13, 14, 15, you know, Richard Pryor was huge. And a friend of mine for my birthday got me uh, Richard Pryor album. And the name of the record was, uh, was That Nigger's Crazy. Uh, mm -hmm. That was the name of it. And I remember putting it on my record player. And it was funny. It was Richard Pryor and, you know, the language and all this and that. You're 13, so every dirty word is just you know, funny. <laughs> and my dad walks into the room, and he starts listening to this. And I'll never go, you know, that, that's going back to the record store. Now listen. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I, don't, I can't even say I appreciated all Richard Pryor's humor at that time. But it was just, um, you know, uh, Dad, oh, I, I, I already know dirty words. You know, see, you're 13 years old. You have that reaction. <laughs> and so, you know, that was my experience with Richard Pryor. And then a few years later, I think it was Richard Pryor Live on the Sunset Strip came out. I, th I think it was that film. And my dad and said to my family, oh, we're going to go see this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh, you know, this is the record that you took out of my house. And this was only like two years later, three <laughs> years later. And we went to this movie, and I was really afraid. I was sitting in the chair like, I don't want to laugh. I'm going to, you know, <laughs> this is a test or something that my dad is putting me through. What dirty words do you know? <laughs> and we sat there as a family and had the best mm. time. And it was just, I realized that this was the moment when my parents were like, you kids are grown up. Mm. You know, we, we can sit, we can listen to this stuff, and it's our thing. And, you know, Richard Pryor was just at that point where he was breaking, but he was just, you know, still talking about, you know, stuff, black folk stuff. <laughs> and it was in a way that it was like, you know what? I, my parents were like, we don't like the words, we don't like the language, but it's us, it's Richard Pryor, he's on the big screen, people want to see it. Get your crap together, we're going to the movies. <laughs> and that was a really nice experience. Well, uh, well, speaking of credit, I, as I mentioned before, uh, this is all about the students who put the show together. Thanks. So the Pollock City students are my awesome team, and I can't believe they actually pulled this off in three days. Thank but it's you. hard work and dedication, and they really believed in it. And of course, I know you're, you're swamped with work. You got the Oscars coming up, but you yeah. came a week before the Oscars, all the way to Santa Barbara to join us. I can't tell you how much it means to me and thank all you. of us. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.